Great. So I want to finish up with, with that, just the last bit of that, and then we're going to look at God's gifts growing, God's gifts growing in the church. Um, so we're focusing on mostly on Acts chapter 12. Those of you that have been part of church for a while, you know Acts chapter 12 very well, okay? Um, it's that strange chapter that's in the middle of Acts, and uh, it has all sorts of things going on, including a king getting eaten by worms, um, and, and, um, and James, the apostle, being beheaded, and Peter being miraculously released, and then even this uh, and then a, a, a servant or a slave girl forgetting that Peter is standing at the door knocking. It's in a dangerous situation because now he's a fugitive from justice. Not really justice because Herod is unjust. But so he's standing on the street in the middle of the night knocking uh, to get in. So all of this is part of this story. And most of us uh, know the, the details of this story very well. And as I said last week, probably most of us have looked through this and not gotten perhaps a lot of spiritual blessing from chapter 12, right? Uh, and then we've kind of kept on going. There's much more in other parts of Acts that bless us. But as we saw last week, God has things to, to say to us um, and to encourage us from in Acts chapter 12. And so as we, just as we finish up this part and then go into, and then go into the next part, just as a reminder, in Acts chapter 12, this Herod is the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who tried to kill the baby Jesus. Uh, he is the nephew of Herod Antipas, who <coughs> beheaded John the Baptist. But unlike his relatives, this Herod is very religious. Did you know that? This Herod is very religious. He's one-fourth Jew from his, on his, gran his grandmother, the, the wife of Herod the Great. He's one-fourth Jew. And he really wants the favor of the Jews who are in control, the Sanhedrin and the, Pharise the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so according to history, this Herod who beheads James and is going to behead Peter, that's his plan, actually goes to the temple and gives temple sacrifice every day and even publicly reads the book of the law. Why does he do this? to gain the favor of the Jews and to maintain political control over Judea and to keep his position in power. Why does he persecute Christians and behead James, the apostle? And we talked about this last week. It said he killed James by the sword. That means, okay, that means he, James was beheaded to gain the favor of the Jews and to maintain his political power. What a wicked man, right? What a wicked man. And when he sees, oh, it pleases the Jews, he... He snatches Peter as well. And apparently when he snatched James and arrested James, there was no trial. He just beheaded him. Um, with Peter, there's going to be a sham trial, but he plans already to behead him as well. Why does he do this? To gain the favor of the Jews and maintain political power. Without God in our hearts and in our lives, people are capable of anything. They really are. And we see the wickedness in the world. We see wickedness in our own countries. And we think, how can this be? Brothers and sisters, listen, one day Jesus, the righteous judge, will rule and reign and everything will be done justly, righteously, and in the right way. Won't that be great? For that alone, it's worth it to be on God's side. It really is. But there are a lot of other reasons to be on God's side, as we're going to see and as we, as we go this morning. So as we talked about this last week, I want to remind you of some, some important things, and it's in your handout if you want to look at, at, um, at some of these things as well. What does this story show us? James is beheaded. Peter, as we know, is miraculously released, and we were just starting to get into that last week. That tells us this morning, reminds us this morning, that God does not play favorites. We live in a world where people have played favorites with us. Maybe our parents played favorites, right? We may have been the unfavored child, or maybe the favored child, or maybe it works sometimes. Some people are treated more fairly than you are, and you may be treated unfairly. God doesn't do that, brothers and sisters. God's always fair. He doesn't play favorites. And so James, whom he loves, James, who was part of the inner circle, including John and Peter, is the very first one 
to be to be martyred, one of the apostles. Do you know that this is the only, exclude Judas who betrayed Jesus, but of the original 12, this death is the only death of an apostle that's recorded, of, of the original apostles that's recorded in the Bible, in the New Testament. Did you know that? James is the only one. And so what else do we learn from this story? A faithful relationship with God and ministry for the Lord these things do not exempt us from hard times and hardships. Um, and when we go through valleys, it doesn't mean that God is displeased with us. Should we examine our lives? Yep, we should, because the Bible, the Bible talks about that. But don't look at yourself and get down on yourself. And don't judge other Christians and say, oh, well, look, they must have sin in their lives, right? We've, we, maybe some of us have done that before. That is no hardship in a Christian's life or ease and blessing in a Christian's life is not necessarily a mark of God's favor or disfavor, is it? Because if we, if we kept that as a rule, then in the New Testament, God would be most angry and most disp displeased with the Apostle Paul, right? Who suffered more than any of us have suffered or will ever suffer and yet Paul is the one who writes nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord so I say to you this morning as I say to my own heart God loves us God's a good God and he takes us through he takes us through James is beheaded Peter is miraculously released, both in God's hands. Brothers and sisters, some things we will not understand in this life. We won't. You just won't. And if you, if your relationship with God is based on why, God, why, you will end up the loser. You will end up the loser. Some things God doesn't tell us. He doesn't. In Deuteronomy, it says, and I, I didn't write the reference down, but in Deuteronomy, it says, the secret things belong to the Lord. And some things are secret things. And how many of you have walked with the Lord and you've gone along, and then at some time later, you had more understanding, and you said, oh, God, that's what you were doing in that situation. Has that ever happened to you? That's happened to me before. But I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I also believe there will be some things that we will go through or that you may be going through now that you may not get an answer to in this life. So what do we do, still keeping this story as our backdrop, what do we do when we go through these things and when we face these things? Go back to who God is. Have you got a question about God? Do you have a big why in your heart? Look at God first. And look at what God sh says about himself. Look at what God reveals about himself. What was the very first thing that God showed about himself before there was sin in the world, before there was man in the world, before anybody was created? God was love. He was Elohim, and that means love. He's a God of love. He's a faithful God. And so when we go through times that are difficult for us and where we're wondering, and you are, some of you are right now, and some of us will, go back and let the foundation be, God, you're a good God. Whatever you do is in context of that. Psalm 119, verse 68. That's what I was looking up. I, I knew the words, but I wanted the reference. Psalm 119, verse 68. There are different translations, but here's one of the translations. You are good, O God, and you do what is good. You are good, O God, and you do what is good. And that's our God, and that's our God. And if we are beheaded, as James was, you are good, O God, and you do what is good. If we are released from prison, as Peter was, you are good, O oh God, and you do what is good. Amen? Amen. 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 And so, Herod has arrested Peter. Herod begins the chapter in triumph, doesn't he? He beheads James. 
He arrests Peter. He's going to execute him the next day. But what Herod doesn't realize is he's fighting against God. And that's what we talked about last week. He's fighting against God. And when we fight against God, we always lose. Yeah? Always lose. We may not immediately lose, but we inevitably lose. May not be immediate, but it is inevitable. God will always win. Whether it is people who fight against God, whether it is powers and thrones and governments that fight against God, God always wins. God always wins. Herod doesn't know it yet. Um, Herod thinks, I'm, well, to use a southern expression, I'll bet I'm the, maybe I'm the only person that knows this. He's in the catbird seat. Have any of you ever heard that before? Then forget it. That's a, southern, that's a southern expression. But in other words, it means he's, he's in power and he's got everything in control. That's what, that's what he thinks. That's how the chapter begins. But we know how the chapter ends, right? He gets eaten by worms. <laughs> he gets eaten by worms. By the way, we're going to get to worms just a little bit, but we're not going to end with worms this morning. <laughs> okay? Aren't you glad? Okay? Aren't you glad? Um, and by the way, it's the enemies of God that get, that get eaten by worms. It's not God's children, okay? And so the church of Jerusalem is, is praying. Peter has prayed. But God is the one who chooses how he's going to jailbreak Peter, okay? He's the one that chooses, and we talked about this last week. And it's a good reminder for us um, because you and I pray, 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 and we think, now, God, you could do it this way. How many of you have it all figured out, and you want God to do it this way? You know what your answer needs to be, right? We've got it all figured out. Um, well, chapter 12 is a good reminder that God seldom does it the way we think he should do it, right? Because there's an angel. Okay, there's an angel, but there's light, there's noise, there's talking. And instead of being boop, transported out of the prison, they walk out of the prison, so forth and so on. God really does it his way, and he does it in a, a, a counterintuitive way, if you want to think about it that way. He really does it in a way that none of us would organize and would plan. So let that encourage you. Let that encourage you. And there's more that's going to encourage us. So Peter himself, here's the interesting thing. Peter himself, as he's walking out with the angel, Peter himself thinks this is a dream. This is not real. By the way, if you have never read the book, the heavenly man. I think we have it in our library. There is a wonderful modern day testimony of, a, of an almost exactly, almost exactly the same a situation that took place just to the north of us uh, some years ago. It's a wonderful book and you'll be so encouraged by it. So Peter thinks it's a dream and then it's only when he comes outside the prison and the iron, the iron doors open and then the angel leaves him and Peter, it says he came to himself and he realized God has delivered me. By the way, I'm so sorry, I have to use my teaching part again because I read it and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and it's an encouragement to us. The way that it's written in chapter 12 tells us that Peter himself was telling this part of the story to Luke, the way that the words are in the, in the original, which I, which I think is kind of, Peter came to himself and said, they tried to do this, but God has delivered me. Praise the Lord. There's the ring of truth throughout the Bible, brothers and sisters. There's the ring of truth in the stories of the New Testaments. We look at them, we think, can this be? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. And so the church is praying. In Acts 12, 5, it says the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That word earnestly means sincerely. It means strongly. It means deeply. It has a related word that means like muscles that are stretched to their limit. That's the type of prayer. That's the type of prayer. A little bit later, uh, later on, James, in James 5, 16, this is not in your notes, uh, James, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus, who was part of this story, by the way, yeah? He's part of this story, writes, the intense prayer of the righteous is very powerful. That's one of the translations. That's James 5, 16. Amen. 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 Are you righteous? You say, oh, but I, whatever. That's, you're not perfect. You're righteous. 
you're righteous. Are you praying? Yes. Intensely? Yes. It's powerful. Uh oh. <laughs> well, at least we're honest, aren't we? <laughs> at least we're honest. But when we get in tough situations, we do pray intensely, don't we? We do pray intensely, and it's powerful. It's powerful. And so, amen is right. And so Peter arrives at the home. Does he go to uh, 5456 Hillwood Road because he knows that Lighthouse Ministries Church is there and people will be praying and knocks on the door? No. In the New Testament, there are no church buildings. All the churches are in a home, right? They're all in a home. And so he goes to the home of Mary where he knows there will be people praying. Isn't that great? There's a, the, the church itself has a good reputation. He knows they're going to be there. He knows they're going to be praying. Can people say that about us when there are tough times going on for, for people who are part of the church? That there are people praying. We know they're praying. We know they're gathered. Now in Jerusalem there would have been other people praying in other places. Peter goes to this home probably because he has a close connection with the people that are part of this home and there are other people praying. So what does he do? He knocks at the outer gate and he says, let me in, let me in. There's a young slave girl. Your Bible translation may say a servant girl. Her name is Rhoda. That means Rose, by the way. Um, and she comes to the door and she hears a voice that she knows. She doesn't even open the peephole. It's Peter. She hears the voice, the Bible says. And she knows it's Peter. Now, you know what that tells you? What that tells us is that Peter has visited there frequently because his voice is recognizable. What that also tells us is because she's overjoyed, that tells us that this servant or slave girl in this family is also a believer in Jesus. That's what it tells us. Praise the Lord. Yeah, for sure. She's so overjoyed, she leaves Peter at the gate and goes running inside to interrupt the prayer meeting. Now, how many of you have heard preachers say bad things or make fun of Rhoda, the servant girl, who leaves Peter standing on the street. I have. But may I say to you this morning, if you're going to make fun of anybody, don't make fun of Rhoda, the servant girl. Instead, make fun of all those Christians who are in there in the prayer meeting. Right? That's right, Stephen. Why? Because they're praying, oh God. Now, what do you think they're praying? Or do you think they're praying, oh God, help Peter to die bravely? Oh God, oh God, may, may, may it not be very painful, Lord. May, Lord, may the sword be sharp and, shh, you know, only one slice. Now, we're, I know. And uh, some of you are looking at me in horror right now. Do you know why I'm saying that? Because I want you to, because we're like that sometimes. We're just like that. Of course that's not what they're praying. What are they praying? Lord, save Peter, right? Lord, deliver Peter. So that's what they're praying for. What does God do? He delivers them. He answers them. Here comes Rhoda running back. Peter's outside. What do all of these in Christians praying intensely, what do they say when Rhoda says he's out there? What do they say? You're out of your mind. You're crazy. You've lost it. And we all have expressions in our mother tongues that talk about being crazy, right? All of us do. They say, you're crazy. So if we're going to make fun of anybody in this story, don't make fun of a little slave girl, Rhoda, who's overjoyed that God has answered prayer. Laugh a little bit at those Christians who have prayed intensely for God to deliver. God delivers, and then you know what it says? In their wisdom, they decide it must be his angel. Do you know what that means? That means... Peter has been, this is Jewish belief. Peter has been, and his angel is there. But Peter is indeed there. And I was thinking about that, and I thought, Lord, now I, 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 this cannot be a direct analogy. This is me, okay? But I thought of something. How many times have you and I also prayed, God, answer, God, do this, God, do this, and God works and he moves and Peter, our Peter is knocking at the gate with the answer, and we just don't see it because we're all, oh, Lord, do this and do that. I think some of us are kind of that way sometimes too, aren't we? I really, I, I really do think that. So 
They answer the door, he goes in, he has to motion them down because they're noisy, and then remember what he says? Tell James and the other leaders who are gathered somewhere else. So they're at another house group praying somewhere, and that's a different James, right? That's the James who will later write the prayers of righteous people are powerful and produce wonderful results. Why can he say that? Because he's seen it. Because he's seen it. And it's true. And it's true. Now, you're looking up here and you're thinking, Pastor, are we ever going to get anything other than the title? <laughs> we certainly are, and we're coming to it right now. So how does it end, this whole episode? Not well for Herod. We're getting to the worms now, okay? So Herod is fighting fighting against God. He leaves Jerusalem for a while. By the way, most Bible scholars believe that he leaves Jerusalem because he has been shamed by the escape of Peter because it was a big deal. He was going to take Peter out and off with his head, but instead Peter escapes and is not found again. And so Herod in vengeance kills the Roman soldiers who guard him, and then he goes off to Caesarea. And Roman records, historical records, say that this Herod never went back to Jerusalem again. He stayed in Caesarea. So sometimes, some time passes, and he has a beef or an argument with some people from another city. And so they want to make peace so that uh, they can get food from his, from his country, from the area of Judea. And Roman records tell us as well as the Bible, you can put both together, they corroborate that at the appointed time, the Roman history tells us it was early in the morning, and Herod put on his royal robes, and the royal robes, according to the Roman historian, had silver in them. So whether it was actual silver or silver threads, we don't know, but it had silver in them. And he goes into the amphitheater of Caesarea, the ruins are still there today, and as the sun rises, it was a Roman feast day, as the sun rises, all of the people are in the amphitheater, and the sun rises, and it was shining on his robes, and he began to, the robes began to shine and glow as the sun came up. And all the people gathered to say, it's the voice of, so he must have said something, and it, everybody says, it's the voice of a god and not of a man. They knew Herod wasn't a god. They knew Herod was a man, but they wanted to gain favor, right? And so they shout that out. And what happens? Herod, let's see what happens. You want a verse now? Here we go. Here we go. There we go. Herod receives the praise of the people, verse 23 Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory, and he was what? Eaten by worms and breathed his last. Now, you say, Pastor Jennifer, you sure are interested in worms this morning. No. What I'm interested in is the victory of God over the enemies of God. That's what I'm interested in. Amen. Amen. Nothing will stand against God and against God's people. Roman history confirms what the Bible says. And the Rome, one of the Roman historians says that he died five days later. And the, for those of you that are even more interested in worms than I am, <laughs> the Greek that's used here implies very, very strongly that it was some sort of intestinal parasite and that it was likely a type of tapeworm that was common in the area and it would have been a painful painful death a painful death but so what does it say there we go I remind you of this verse this is in your notes the rulers plot together against the Lord just as Herod did but the one who rules in heaven laughs the Lord scoffs at them not that the Lord takes delight in the death of anyone, because he's good, isn't he? Even those who are wicked, the Lord wants, what does it say? Before we sit here and say, yay, he got eaten by worms, remember what the Bible says. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Nevertheless, God will win. 
God will win. But you know, I don't want to end this section with worms. Let's end with verse 24. Because God always wins. Verse 24, so he breathed his last. Verse 24 of Acts 12. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Okay, how does the word of God increase and multiply? We're going to look at the gifts of God in the time that we have left. So how does the word of God increase and multiply? The end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 13 tell us. So this is like a sandwich for us. Here's this unusual story in the middle and then the bread on either side. On, on the bread on either side. And so we see this church, this young church, and it's the church is a Gentile church. It's the church of Antioch. It's healthy. It's balanced. Now we're getting into the gifts that grow the church. Do you need to stretch just a minute? We're still here, right? Gifts grow the church, and it's maturing spiritually. How do we know that the Word of God is increasing and multiplying? Because the Word of God tells us. Is this not working this morning? at all. Okay. So I'll, I'll tell you. There we go. Okay. So we look at Acts 11. We'll, that's okay. We can, we, can, we can work with it. So we see here that when Barnabas arrives, he sees the grace of God. He encourages all of them to remain true to the Lord with a firm resolve, for he was a good man. And many people were added to the Lord. Some of this we've talked about already, but this is what I want us to see this morning. Let's focus with me on this this morning as we look at these gifts of God. What is one of the reasons that the church of God thrives and grows? The church of God thrives and grows because there's a man called Barnabas, not because he is so great, but because God has given him the gift of encouragement. It's a gift. Why does God give gifts to his people? So they can say, whoo, I've got a gift, look at me. No. Gifts are given to grow the church, to strengthen the church. That is confirmed. Every New Testament scripture that talks about God's gift, talk about this. And we're going to look just a few. And I want to encourage you this morning because I don't want to teach us a history lesson. I want to give us an example of somebody called Barnabas. And we are like that as well. God has given you gifts this morning. And he's given me gifts this morning. Why? To grow the church. Are you a brand new Christian? God has given you at least one gift. Why? To grow the church. To strengthen the church. To bless the church. To enrich, enrich the church. So what is one of the reasons that this church begins to grow in Antioch? It's, it's, it doesn't have a strong Christian foundation. It comes out of a pagan culture. It doesn't have the Jewish, even the Jewish belief in one God as Jews did. These are pagans. They believed in many gods. But many people are added to the church. And it's a great church. It's a great church. Why? Because God's gifts are being used there. Now, so Barnabas is encouraging and he's talking and he's teaching. But, beloved, to help young Christians grow and mature, we need more than the gift of encouragement, don't we? What else do we need? What is another gift that is needed to help young Christians grow up in the Lord and begin to get mature? You tell me before we look at the scripture. What's the, next, what's the next gift that God gives to the church that is needed to help a church grow? What? Say it again, Cindy. Yeah. The gift of teaching, whether it is in various people or whether it is a teacher. We'll look at that in just a minute. So let's see what happens next, okay? What do we read? So Barnabas went to Tarsus. Oh, what a great guy. He wasn't possessive. He wasn't this is my church and these are my people and I'm going to get the credit for this. No. When God's gifts are properly used, listen, brothers and sisters, God's gifts properly used, there's room for everybody. There's room for every gift. There's no room for jealousy. There's room for every gift to function. Every gift is complementary in the church of God. So don't look at somebody else and say, oh, well, their gift is blah, 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 or whatever. Instead, say, God, how do you want to use me? 
and God will make room for you because he's got gifts in you for the church here at Lighthouse or, or, or wherever or, or whatever. And so Barnabas goes to Tarsus. What a great man. He realizes, I've got a strong gift of encouragement, but a hundred miles from here, there's a man called Saul, and I remember him from four or more years ago, and I know he has the gift of teaching, and I know that he is called to teach Gentiles. He has a gift and a calling. And so what does he do? He goes to Tarsus. He looks for Saul. By the way, Tarsus is a university town educated, third most important city in the whole Roman Empire after Rome and Alexandria. So Tarsus. And when he had found him, that means it wasn't so easy. He had to look for him. What does it say? He brought him to Antioch. Now, here we go. God's gifts grow the church. What does it say? For a whole year, they met with the church. And what did they do? They taught a great many people. God's gifts grow the church, beloved. God's gifts grow the church. We need encouragement, but encouragement is not enough. That's one of the reasons at Lighthouse that we have our foundations classes. That's why we have the you are welcome. That's why some of you, you ha we have the small groups. There's teaching. There's encouragement. There are all of these things. All of these things are going on. So there's the gift of teaching. There's the gift of encouragement. There's another gift that's helping to grow the church. And what is it? We saw it a little bit earlier. In the beginning of the church, I believe, and you know this is the heartbeat of Pastor Renee, um, God has gifted us. There's some overlap in your pastor's gifts, but there are areas where I'm gifted more strongly. There are areas where Pastor Renee is gifted more strongly. And you know this is his heartbeat. It's the heartbeat of evangelism that's right evangelism and that's why a little bit later in November there's going to be another evangelism training with practical let's get involved or whatever why that's part of growing the church and so I want you to see something here this morning we know the name of Barnabas we know the name of Saul but the gift of evangelism is practiced and is used by people whose names we don't even know here in verse 20. But then there is more as well. And so we see these gifts in the church. Listen, brothers and sisters, God has, just as he gave the Antioch church, we love the Antioch church. We have them on a pedestal. But I want to say something to you this morning. It is an example, not historical, to say, oh, well, what, weren't they great? It is an example to you and to me and to Lighthouse to spur us on. I mean it. God has given us everything we need to be a strong church, to be a growing church, to be a church rich in every way, to be, as we would say if we were speaking Chinese, feng fu, rich, right? Abundant, feng fu, overflowing in all of, sorry, that, you know, that's, that, that comes from my, my connection, to be overflowing and to be abundant through his word, through his gifts, through the empowering of his spirit. If there is a lack in Lighthouse, I'm speaking very for us as a local church this morning. If there is a lack in Lighthouse this morning, it is not because of God. Because God gives his church what is needed. And so I challenge us this morning. What gift or gifts has God put in you that you are shy to use? That you're hesitant to use? That you are reluctant to use? that you are saying, well, they're better in this gifting than I am, so let them do it. Now, God doesn't say that. And you know what? I know that's, tr I know that's true. We look at somebody else, so they do it better than I do. God gives gifts to his church, and if there's a lack this morning, it's not because of God. It's not because of God. May I say something to you in a very practical way this morning? God has given you gifts, each one of you this morning, if you're a Christian. If you're not yet a Christian, then God has not yet given you a gift. God only gives gifts to his children for his church, okay? Only. As soon as you become a Christian, God gives at least one gift. And what I want to say to you is this. For those of you who are hesitant, reluctant, and shy this morning, what I want to say to you is... 
you may not get it right the first time you use the gifts that God gives you. you. It may be a little bit messed up. It may be a little bit imperfect. And because we're people, do you know what we do? In pride, we say, well, I'm not doing that again. I really blew it. I said the wrong thing. I didn't do it right. And I, whatever. And they rejected. And, and, and I tried to help, but blah, 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 blah. May I say to you, that's pride. It's the wrong type of pride, right? We're trying to save face. We're, we're trying to, well, I don't, I don't want people to talk about me. Nope. You get up, you do it again. That's on your part. What is it on other people's parts? On other people's parts, we give grace. Listen, we give grace. Why? The gifts of God are perfect gifts, but the gifts of God are put in vessels of clay, in human vessels, and we are imperfect. So the next time somebody uses gifts and is trying to serve the Lord, and it may not be quite right, and it may not be quite perfect, but they're trying to serve the Lord, instead of roasting them, and instead of thinking, figuring out all the ways they did this, 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 and this wrong, and psh, well, blah, 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 instead, give a little grace. Why not? Give a little grace. Give a little encouragement and pray for them and, and keep on going because God's gifts grow the church. God's gifts grow the church. Now, I want to end with this this morning because there's one more gift that shows up. And I thought I was going to get to the end, but um, I didn't. But let's end with prophets this morning. Whoo! That's one of the gifts. Aren't you excited about that? How many of you want the gift of prophecy? You get to wear a long robe. You get to walk around. You get to say, Thus saith the Lord in a special voice. That's what we think, isn't it? Uh-uh. Let's see what the Bible says because here's one more gift that grows the church. In those days, it's while all of this is going on, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus. By the way, if you, <clears throat> if you really praise Agabus and you think, wow, look at Agabus the prophet. May I, may I encourage you this morning? His name means grasshopper. <laughs> so <laughs> let, that, let that encourage you, okay? A grasshopper. He stands up. Look with me as we, as we in the last three or four minutes as we close up, as we close. He stood up. And he predicted, what does it say? You, you tell me the next three words. What does it say? He predicted how? By the, By the Spirit. Which Spirit? The Holy Spirit. By God, the Holy Spirit. He doesn't do it himself. It's not his own idea. It's not his own, ooh, let me, whatever. It comes from God, the Holy Spirit, because it's a gift of God. And he predicted there would be a famine throughout the Roman world. And this took place during the time of Claudius. And it's recorded. It really happened. There was a famine around, say, 45 to uh, A.D., 45 to 47 A.D. or whatever. Now, if I, I don't know about you, but if I were choosing gifts, I'd want to choose the prophet gift. Because, you know, that's so, that's so fancy, right? Uh, you'd get to walk, you'd get to go around from church to church. You know, pastors and teachers, we you know we just we stay at lighthouse. You know, we're 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 down the totem pole. But a prophet, wow, or an apostle or somebody like that. Look with me at what the Bible says. When the Bible in the New Testament, when it talks about pro prophets that grow the church, there are two ways that it talks about it. First is foretelling or prediction. Okay, and that's what Agabus does right here. He says there's going to be a famine, okay? Most of us think, oh, that's what prophets do. How many of you have gone to meetings where there was a prophet who stood and said, I've got a prophecy for you, and I've got a prophecy for you, and I've got a prophecy for you, and I've got a prophecy for you. Prophecy for you. Now, God can do whatever he wants to, but I prefer to look at what the Bible shows us that prophets do, okay? So here is foretelling or prediction. And then the other one, much more common, is forthtelling or preaching. It's one of the gifts. And it will be an inspired message at that moment for that location, for those people, for that church. Most of the time, that's what prophets did. Does that make sense? It's not so much, this will happen. 
It is instead the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for a particular moment. And we see it throughout the New Testament. We see it throughout the New Testament. Now, what am I doing this morning? What gift am I practicing this morning? I'm, although I'm preaching, I'm not really practicing. I don't think I'm not really practicing the gift. I'm not using the gift of prophecy this morning. But I am using a gift. What gift am I using right now? I'm using the gift of teaching as I preach, right? And it is, it is a gifting of God to help me understand Scripture and explain it and present it in a way that blesses and benefits and helps you. It's a gift, not me. It's God, right? But then there will be other times. Have you ever heard Pastor Renee or me at other times in a moment? It wouldn't. Generally, it's not planned. Generally, it's not prepared. Generally, it's not whatever. It may come in prayer times. It may come when one of us stands up and suddenly there's something and it's a word that's spoken and you feel it and it's different from regular, from preaching, which is also inspired. Have there ever been times like that? Sure there have been. And you knew that's a direct message to you at that time. That's prophecy. That's the gift of prophecy. There was no special voice. There was no, thus saith the Lord or whatever. But may I say to you, if God uses you in that way, it's not just the pastors because the Bible makes it very clear. You know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14? And I'm coming to a close. <laughs> Stay with me as we come to a close. He says, all of you may prophesy. All of you may prophesy. No, 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 no. That's for the pastors. That's for the leaders. All of you may prophesy. Why? Because it's a gift of God for the church, and it grows the church. Will you tingle? You probably won't tingle. <laughs> Will you have a special voice? You probably won't have a special voice. What should you do? You know what you should do or what you can do? What you can say is, if it's in a small group on Friday nights or Sunday afternoons, you can say, I think what the Lord is, you don't have to say, well, no, no, no. just say, I think the Lord is saying, and then you just share, and you just do it. And the gift of God through you will grow the church. It will grow the church. It will grow the church. You want Lighthouse to grow? Yes. Oh, so do I. Use your gift. Use your gift. Use your gift. Pastor Renee and I are not enough. We're not enough. Your worship leaders, as much as we love Panina and Chris and Stephen, they're not enough. Your Bible teachers, your small group leaders, as much as we appreciate them, they're not enough. God gives gifts to each one of you to grow the church. And we want Lighthouse to grow. Let's close in prayer. Amen. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we thank you for your gifts. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would embolden and encourage and give confidence to your people in this place to accept and to believe and to step out in faith with the gift or the gifts that you have given them, whether it is just used for one person or for many. Oh, God, grow your church through your gifts. We present ourselves to you. Would you do that just as we close this morning? Just present yourself to the Lord and just tell God what's in your heart. You may say, God, I'm scared. <laughs> You may say, God, I don't know if I can do it or not, but it's God's gift and he puts it in you to grow the church. God, here we are, every one of us. And Lord, for those, of, for, Lord, for those that have never practiced and used their gift before that you have given them, Lord, may they have confidence just to begin to step out and to keep on stepping out. Lord, for those of us who recognize your gifts in our lives, I ask, O oh Lord, that we'd continue to fan into flames and be faithful and diligent stewards of the gifts you have given us to grow your church. And we pray, O oh God, that we would use these gifts in humility, submitted to you, that we would not be jealous, but that we would be faithful stewards, O oh God. And Lord, we ask for more giftings among 
your people and in your church that your church might grow, that Lighthouse might be the rich, bountiful, overflowing church that you have planned for us to be because you're a rich, bountiful, generous God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.